singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature Singularity weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As always, you can guys help me make this show better in one of two ways. You can simply go to iTunes and write a brief review, or you can make a donation on my donations page. Today, my guest on the show is Ken Hayworth. Uh, Ken is uh, the person behind a very unique and uh, new cutting-edge uh, way of brain preservation. And uh, that's, of course, the reason why I wanted to bring him on the show. So without further ado, let me welcome Ken and say hi, Ken, and welcome to the show. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for having me on. Fantastic. Uh, Ken, uh, I kind of messed up your introduction here a little bit. So let me ask you to please introduce yourself. What do you do and, and so on? Yeah, so um, uh, let me let me correct one thing. Uh, so I don't actually um, uh, do brain preservation myself. Uh, I actually, um, uh, my background uh, is in electron microscopy of neural tissue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, in, I invent uh, different techniques for uh, mapping brain circuitry at the uh, at the nanometer scale, and um, I. In that process, I come across um, uh, uh, the standard techniques that people have used for preserving brain tissue, uh, very small pieces of brain tissue. And uh, I have uh, realized, um, uh, along with other people, that uh, if this could be expanded, these uh, standard techniques, if they could be expanded to a whole human brain, uh, then that would be a quite revolutionary thing uh, to have the ability to do to uh, preserve an entire human brain uh, for, uh, for future technology to, um, uh, to use and to possibly bring back the individual. And so uh, I started the, uh, uh, the Brain Preservation Foundation uh, a few years ago. Uh, we have a Brain Preservation Prize. Uh, and basically, it's a, a challenge uh, to the scientific community and also the cryonics community um, uh, to... Uh, to develop a technique, any technique that can preserve an entire human brain at the level that neuroscience says is required to um, uh, to preserve all the memories and personalities of an individual, namely the synaptic connectivity of the uh, of the brain. And so uh, I, I get a chance to work with uh, uh, with uh, uh, great groups of people that actually do research in brain preservation. Mm -hmm. So I should probably have called you a champion of a, of a, of a new and different way of uh, right. proposal for, for brain preservation. Now, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, do you have an official, uh, what's your full-time uh, day job uh, title? And, yeah, so my... and where do you work and, and uh, do you have any scientific background? Yes. So um, uh, my my full time job is uh, I'm a senior scientist at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Jamalia Farm Research Campus. Uh, before that, I was at uh, Harvard University uh, doing a postdoc um, uh, again on electron microscopy, and I have a PhD in neuroscience from the um, uh, University of Southern California. Uh, in cognitive neuroscience, uh, studying the visual system of human beings and modeling it, um, uh, the computations that are done within it. That's fantastic. Uh, so before we move on to, to the uh, meat of the matter here, as it were, I'd like to roll back the tape a little bit and ask you, Ken, what was so interesting about you know, electromicroscopy, and why did you get inspired or decide to work in that field? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, well, if you wanted to go way back, uh, I think um, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was absolutely, um, uh, I absolutely wanted to go into space. I think there's a lot of people out there that are like that. I, I love Star Trek episodes, and uh, and I absolutely wanted to get off of this rock and go explore the moons of Jupiter or the next star system or something like that. 
And uh, as a as a little kid, I kind of made a, a a pledge to myself that I would eventually do that. But I haven't gotten anywhere close to that. But when I got old enough to um, uh, to look into the actual science behind uh, uh, going into space and especially going to the nearest star system. I was really depressed that, uh, that it took so much, so much technology. And, um, maybe I was about 15 at this time and I came across, I was reading books like the Starflight Handbook and things like that that would talk about antimatter rockets. And I came across, uh, this, uh, relatively new field of neural networks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it dawned upon me, like it dawns upon a lot of people, I suppose, that, uh, that the problem with spaceflight is Human beings—they're too heavy. They take too much. Um, uh, uh, they take too much resources, and that uh, if we are just information, which is what neuroscience and cognitive science tells us, then we have sitting in front of us a light-speed travel method because our radio waves already go at the speed of light. Uh, and so I, I pretty much switched gears. I said, "I found it. The the way of." of getting to the stars is by neuroscience. It's not by developing a, um, a, a multi-generation humongous spacecraft that costs trillions of dollars uh, with engines that we don't even have the physics to begin to understand how they could work. Uh, it's right in front of us. It's neuroscience. And if we can understand how the brain works and how to extract what we really are from the brain, then encoded in ones and zeros, we'll be able to um, uh, transport that uh, uh, via radio waves to, uh, in a very efficient way, to um, any receiver that we put out there on any of these systems. Mm-hmm. So, is it fair to say that ultimately your goal is to sort of travel the galaxy or the universe? Um, <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say that, but uh, uh, the... I, 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 I think it's I think it's traditional that people get um, uh, people get interested in one thing, it leads to another thing, and then they realize that they're even more interested in that <laughs> the thing, thing that it led to. Yes. And so the uh, uh, it is it is very exciting still the idea of space travel, and I would love to uh, experience that. Uh, but the the possibilities of actually understanding a uh, how a human mind works putting it into a different substrate that doesn't have disease, doesn't have uh, limitations, uh, uh, that is an even greater frontier than, than space travel. Mm-hmm. And I hope uh, to, uh, to get to see uh, both of those. Yeah, uh, I have to agree with you entirely that I think that the most likely method of colonizing, you know, the galaxy and, and perhaps the universe would be uh, not within our bodies, which can only take so many G's and, you know, require so much energy and space and so on and so on to sustain them. But with my mind uploading and with perhaps beaming ourselves across the universe. Um, but you gave us a little bit of a glimpse on your other motivation, on your additional motivation to do that work, which it seems to me that now is kind of taking over. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about that that you just mentioned, the conquering disease and so on? Yeah, well, um, so so I'm, I'm one of many people that uh, believe that the future is going to be, um, uh, we're going to get better and better and better in technology, that we are going to cure diseases, uh, that we are um, going to have fantastic levels of technology that can um, uh, can scan an entire human brain, can repair, uh, uh, things, biological damage that we wouldn't dream of being able to repair today. And so, uh, uh, but at the same time, I, uh, you know, I look around and I see how fast we're moving, uh, toward that. And we're not moving fast enough for people today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I am not one of the people who believes that, uh, Aging will be cured in uh, in my natural lifetime. Um, I'm not sure if it will be cured in my kids' natural lifetime. Uh, I am uh, uh, skeptical. 
of uh, so let me stop you right there for a second so you're skeptical on curing aging in your lifetime and perhaps even your kids lifetime but are you equally skeptical or or not so skeptical about being able to uh, mind upload people in your lifetime yes yes I, I am yes meaning uh, I guess skeptical or optimistic you, I'm sorry one more time uh, yes you're optimistic or you're skeptical I'm I'm skeptical uh, I think it's uh, uploading a uploading a human being uh, is an incredibly difficult task. If we wanted to get there, uh, it would still take decades and decades. Um, uh, and uh, we're we're not exactly uh, putting all of our resources into a grand Apollo project to upload a human being. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, uh, so so. No, we are, we're, we're, we're probably many decades away from, uh, uploading a human being. We're probably many decades away from, uh, curing aging. Uh, there are so many diseases, um, that, that would, would have to be conquered. Uh, and so, uh, I think the, the, uh, you know, I'd like to be proved wrong, obviously, but I think that, uh, brain preservation, uh, like cryonics. Now, the idea of cryonics is simply that, uh, we accept that we will be, that we will have advanced medical technology in the future that will be able to cure whatever, uh, is, uh, has happened to us, um, uh, today. But we can't get there unless we go into some kind of state of suspended animation. And so the question is really, uh, uh, you know, where do we put our resources? And, and from, from what I've seen, the, the problem of curing aging is, uh, is enormous. The problem of mind uploading is enormous. The problem of putting somebody in suspended animation is not enormous. Especially if you come to grips with the idea that, uh, that we, we should think outside the cryonics box. We don't have to, um, uh, we don't have to think about technologies that are just a hair's breadth beyond what we have today and think, okay, well, this is almost good enough to just be rewarmed, uh, and, uh, and the person walks off the table. Uh, if we can look at technologies that are preserving, uh, uh, using chemical preservation, uh, the structures of the brain, then we have a, a, a quite advanced, uh, since the 1950s, we have been doing a very uh, good chemical fixation and plastic embedding of brain tissue uh, uh, at the electro, uh, so that we can look at the brain at the electron microscope level. I mean, by definition, this has to be extremely good preservation because all of the textbooks since the 1950s have been saying, this is what, how the brain works. This is what the synapse looks like, uh, using these chemical, uh, preservation techniques. And so, and so if we, if we look at that and say, wow, all that we have to do is take that existing technology and apply it to larger brain volumes, a whole human brain, then that's the suspended animation that, uh, that we might have been looking for. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, that will allow us to, uh, uh, to put somebody on the shelf, uh, in, in a non-decaying state that can last literally for, for probably for millions of years in that, in that type of chemical preservation, plastic embedding environment to wait the technology that can bring them back. Mm-hmm. And this is especially important because we can now see the types of technologies that could possibly be bringing somebody back, uh, from that, um, chemically, uh, preserved and plastic embedded state. Ken, um, I want to come back to the topic here and, and talk more about uh, your proposal for chemical brain preservation and and uh, the difference between that and cryonics. But before that, um, I want to g- grab uh, one point that you made before that and talk a little bit more about that, and that's about the fact that you're skeptical about mind uploading. So um, I had uh, Dr. Randall Kuna on my show, and mm. according to him, uh, mind uploading is not science fiction anymore. And while he also agrees absolutely that it's uh, a humongous undertaking, 
he doesn't dismiss it outright that it might be possible. To, in fact, he says that it probably would be possible within our lifetime, if I remember correctly. Uh, also, uh, we have at least two other... Uh, so, Randall Kuna works on what he calls uh, whole brain emulation. Now, we have people like Dr. Henry Makram, who works on a uh, whole brain simulation project and who wants to raise a billion dollars and who believes that it is entirely doable, uh, I think, in our lifetime. Uh, and finally, a, a third project that comes to mind is the IBM Synapse uh, project that's funded by DARPA and I think is led by Dhametra Motha. And I think IBM actually has a, a much more ambitious timeline and they're uh, aiming to map an entire brain by, I think, something like 2018, uh, which is very ambitious. So, therefore, doesn't it seem that, you know, a number of people are pursuing those different ways of, of accomplishing that task, but within a decade or two, clearly, within our lifetime. Doesn't that give you... Uh, any sign or evidence to, to hope that you might be wrong? Um, uh, well, I can always hope that I'm wrong. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Randall's probably, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a healthier guy than I, and maybe he uh, works out better and stuff. Uh, um, uh, so it could be a difference in lifespan, <laughs> <laughs> or assumed lifespan. Uh, in any case, if you, if you look at these technologies, um, uh, so, so the, the, the DARPA Synapse project, uh, and Henry Markham's project, I, 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 to my understanding, those are, uh, those are, um, uh, computer simulations only. They don't address the biology side. And so we, we really have, uh, a, a, what, what, what Randall is talking about, um, what he may be talking, he talks about a lot of the different technologies, but I, I think the one that you're, uh, um, referring to, is the idea of uh, having a uh, a really massive functional recording of all the neurons in the brain uh, uh, during uh, um, during somebody's awake behaving um, uh, uh, experience, and so that could give you the information to create a simulation. Uh, so if we, if we look at these different technologies, let's say, I, I'm, I'm gonna pick three that I think are, um, that are relevant to this type of mind uploading. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, you can, uh, you can, you could get to mind uploading by, uh, by doing whole brain recording, uh, of every neuron in a, in a, in a, in a, in a brain. And then doing the simulation on a computer. Uh, that technology is advancing, but I would not say that it is going to be in a few decades. It is, it, it is incredibly difficult. I mean, the, the place where they are now, the things that you would have to be able to do is you'd, at the very least, you'd have to, uh, get gene, advanced gene therapy to work because you're going to have to use advanced gene therapy to get the recording instruments into each of the cells. And so there, there are a lot of different technology leaps that have to occur to get that to work. Not, not, uh, and, and, and the hardest is definitely not the computer simulation of Markham, et cetera. Um, uh, there is, uh, uh, well, let's just take the other example. Let's just say two. Um, uh, the other way of mind uploading is to get the connectome of an individual, getting uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, electron microscopy of the uh, of the entire uh, 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 of, of the entire circuitry of the brain, uh, mapping that out, and uh, Understanding that in such a way that you can get it into a brain emulation. Again, this requires a lot of new neuroscience information. This requires all the mapping technology exists. Uh, and 
the neuroscience that will come from that mapping technology. And again, the brain emulation. So I just, I can't bring myself to accept that that's going to be done in less than a few decades. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm too skeptical of that. It just, it seems too difficult, all of those problems. Plus, if you look at the first part of that procedure, the first part of that brain emulation, uh, that brain, uh, uh, mind uploading procedure is exactly some type of brain preservation. Because you, you have to at some point, uh, put the brain into a state that can, uh, allow it to have, uh, high resolution imaging performed on it. Mm-hmm. And the only way that we know how to do that is chemical, uh, fixation and plastic embedding today. Right. So, so it really comes down to, uh, you know, you can say, is it going to be two decades? Is it going to be five decades? Is it going to be 20 decades? It doesn't really matter. It, it comes down to, uh, uh, it's going to be, uh, really, really difficult. And most likely you're not going to get there. The best way to put your resources, the, uh, the best place to put the resources, in my mind, certainly, are to go into the preservation steps so that you have time to get to that technology. Mm-hmm. So I'm not doubting that the technology is going to get here. I'm just doubting that it's going to get here uh, at any of the time scales that um, uh, that its most advanced uh, advocates are, are saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I... I... I think you're making a pretty good argument. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, you know, history, I mean, some people say an expert is someone who can tell you what is not possible. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, history is full of examples like that. Uh, what comes to my mind right now, for example, is uh, the president of the Royal Society wrote uh, Lord Kelvin, I think, who in 1896 famously uh, argued that you know, heavier than air aircraft are absolutely impossible to create. And yeah. then six years later, two bicycle makers from the United States, the Wright brothers, who were bicycle makers, they were not really scientists, proved him wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. so and there's plenty of those examples. And I, I would love to be, uh, I'd love to be proved wrong on this. Yeah. But, but the thing is that most of our, uh, most of our citizens out there, uh, uh, don't even go with the, with the first argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would, they would say, this will never happen. Uh, that mind uploading is impossible in principle. And I think that that's particularly, uh, uh, you know, that, that is on the order of the type of skepticism that we need to, um, uh, uh, that we need to argue against. Yeah, I, I want to grab that point right on here and actually read a passage of one of your papers that I read as preparation for this interview. It's uh, from actually page three of a paper called Killed by Bad Philosophy, Why Brain Preservation Followed by Mind Uploading is a Cure for Death. And it was written by you in January 2010. So the uh, the paragraph goes like this. Our grandparents had the technology to preserve the precise neural circuitry of their brains for long-term storage. The best science of our grandparents' era started, uh, stated unequivocally that this unique patterning of neutral circuitry was the seat of the self. In it was written all memory, skills, and personality. Our grandparents seemed to gasp to grasp the quickening pace of technology and understood that full brain scanning and simulation was around the corner. Why then did Grandpa and the rest of his generation reject brain preservation in mind uploading as a means of overcoming death? And after considering the evidence, our grandchildren will come to the sad conclusion that we were killed by our bad philosophy. No matter how clear the science was, we simply could not really accept the fact that we were physical machines. Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a very strong and very uh, very good paragraph, so I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more and unpack it for us. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, uh, uh, this is from an essay that was, uh, it's a part of an essay where it's looking back from the year uh, uh, 
2100, so 100 years from now, uh, um, uh, 2110, I guess. Um, and, and basically looking back with, with hindsight and saying, uh, what should the, what, sh- how should resources have been allocated and how should people have, uh, viewed their, uh, their options for getting to the, to the future? Because essentially, uh, essentially we all should be jealous of people in the future. Uh, you know, a hundred years from now, a couple hundred years from now, people are going to be, um, uh, you know, just like people 200 years ago should be jealous of us, you know, flying airplanes and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, living healthier lives and, uh, have antibiotics and wonderful things. And, uh, and people 200 years from now are going to look back and say, uh, you know, death was horrible. Um, and I, I'm surprised people could, could stand it. Uh, you know, they, they, they should have been concentrating all of their, uh, all of their time and resources on, uh, on overcoming this, uh, this great human limitation of, of disease and death. And, and, uh, if you look at it in that perspective, you can say, okay, so what is the, uh, what were the resource allocations that people should have, uh, made today? Uh, and I think that from the future's perspective, they will see, oh, uh, brain preservation is the logical lifeboat that people, uh, have access to today. Uh, it is the, it is the, it, it is a technology that people can, uh, develop relatively easily. It's not, it, it doesn't require new physics. It doesn't require new biology. It requires a little bit of surgical technique advancement. And, uh, uh, and some protocol development. And that's, and that's all. And, and the fact that, uh, that nobody, uh, was doing that research. So I should, I should correct. I, I, I'm not proposing chemical brain preservation, uh, as, as a, uh, cryonics alternative. Uh, uh, I, I, I am proposing that, but I'm certainly not the first person to propose that. Of course, its, its roots go way back in the cryonics community as well. Um, and, uh, there's a guy named Charles Olson that wrote a paper probably 20 years ago, uh, that, uh, made it very explicit that this is uh, something that should be developed. Uh, so, uh, it, it is certainly the case that other people, in fact, in fact, Carl Sagan, uh, has a wonderful piece, uh, in his book, Broca's Brain, uh, that is very tantalizing about the possibility of chemical brain preservation. Um, it's, uh, it's surprising that he didn't follow up on it, um, uh, more. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. No, go ahead. So, yeah. So let me ask you then, can you walk us through the sort of the, de- the details or the procedure of of chemical brain preservation as you, as you see it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so chemical brain preservation has been, uh, has been done as part of electron microscopy for, uh, uh, since the 1950s. Uh, what, what happens is that the, the animal that you're, um, going to look at under the electron microscope eventually, uh, the animal, uh, is alive. You put them under anesthesia. And then you, um, open their, uh, their chest cavity up and, uh, and, and go directly into their, uh, their heart, their left ventricle with, uh, uh, with a, with a needle that will perfuse, uh, a, 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 f- a formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. It's, it's similar to embalming fluid, but it's more aggressive than embalming fluid. Uh, that glutaraldehyde uh, is a, is a chemical that actually, uh, has two reactive groups that binds proteins together. It basically glues the machinery of the cell together, uh, to almost instantly prevent decay. It obviously kills the organism. It is the, one of the most toxic chemicals around, but it kills it in such a way that it is basically just sticking proteins together. Uh, that means that you don't have a lot of structural, uh, changes in the, in the cells. 
and uh, the proteins that are uh, that should be at some place within a, a neuron usually stay within that place in the neuron. And it happens so rapidly. This is one of the advantages of this versus cryonics, by the way, just a, uh, a little off, off the track. Uh, the, the amount of time that you go from a, uh, a decaying to a non-decaying state, a, a static state that you can, uh, that is, that is stable is just probably less than a minute in, uh, in chemical brain preservation. Whereas in cryonics, you have to go through hours of, of, uh, of slow perfusion so that you can eventually get enough prior protective agent in to get to a low enough temperature that you stop by temperature the decay processes. Mm -hmm. So if you're, the, the idea of using chemical means to really hammer the decay processes, uh, into a stable state, uh, is, is, is a real key advantage that I think it's, it's lost in this discussion at certain points. In any case, once you, um, uh, once you, uh, perfuse, um, uh, through the bloodstream, uh, with this glutaraldehyde solution, uh, you, you now have something that is stable for days and days and days at least. You're not going to be able to leave it in that type of a situation because there's still chemical, very slow chemical reactions that are going on. So what people will do, uh, in the traditional method, is that they will then take the small region of the brain tissue that they're interested in, they'll dissect that out. They, uh, this is traditional electron microscopy. Uh, they will put that in a chemical cause, called osmium tetroxide, uh, which stabilizes the lipids of the membranes. And at that point, all the major uh, molecular species, the proteins and the lipids, are, are in a stable state, and that allows the final step of extracting the water and replacing it with plastic to occur. Mm -hmm. If you didn't stabilize everything before that step, there would be, uh, there would be a problem. So once you uh, extract the water, replace it with plastic, you can cure that plastic. What you get is a solid block of no water tissue, uh, that can literally, it is, it is perfect fossil. Uh, it is, it is the, it is, it is like an insect caught in amber, except uh, at all levels, <laughs> the amber has preserved everything. So mm -hmm. It's just a perfect fossil, and it could last for literally millions of years. So uh, basically, you're turning us into human fossils. Uh, it, 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 essentially, yes. Essentially, yes. So um, so the only part of that procedure that, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't work on larger uh, uh, brains is, uh, are the one that is, has been mainly been said in the scientific literature not to, uh, go to larger brain tissue is the, uh, is the osmium tetroxide step, actually. So traditionally, as I said, you, 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 you perfuse with glutaraldehyde the entire organism. The entire organism is, is chemically fixed from a protein point of view. But for, uh, specific reasons, the, uh, the, fixing of the lipids has been only achievable for very small volumes, less than a cubic millimeter, mm -hmm. until today, because the uh, 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 the work of Sean Mikula, uh, which is one of the uh, groups that is um, uh, competing for our Brain Preservation Prize, has been working really hard on overcoming that step, so that he can, This is he's a scientist, neuroscientist, neuroanatomist that is trying to uh, to map out the circuitry of a whole mouse brain. But a whole mouse brain is, is huge from this perspective. So he's had to address this, this, uh, this osmium tetroxide penetration issue. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, has shown great results. He's recently published in Nature, uh, Nature Methods. Uh, and he's got, he's got great results, uh, showing that you can get a whole mouse brain preserved not as good as the, as the main electron microscopy that people have been doing. But just stunningly, uh, stunningly good. Um, uh, he, he may very well be winning our prize very soon. Uh, we are in the process of, of, of doing evaluation. Uh, but this is, uh, irrespective of that, this is a major advancement in the field of electron microscopy to be able to do an entire mouse brain, uh, uh, preserved so that you can do electron microscopy. Uh, on it at this resolution. And so would that mean that the next step up would be 
a human brain eventually? I, absolutely, eventually it would be a human brain. So how, how I see this going, um, I mean, we need to... Uh, uh, there is there is no use. Let me let me get this very straight out front. Uh, nobody should apply any of these techniques to a human being until they are uh, until they have been checked out with the medical and scientific community, and we have good verification that they preserve the neural structure. Mm-hmm. Okay, we can we can argue to a certain extent about what what level of criteria should be used for when it is ready to apply to a human being. But I think if you look at the lessons from cryopics, uh, that was applied to human beings way too early, in my opinion. It was applied to human beings way too early. And the scientific community, uh, rightly, uh, had to distance itself from that. And the overcompensation that the scientific community did from those uh, uh, applications to humans was detrimental to our to the entire human race because what it basically said is now we're not going to do the scientific mainstream scientific research that is required mm-hmm. to get this to work to eventually be applied to human beings. We cannot let that do that happen on chemical brain preservation, and we and we need to undo it on chronic preservation. We need to get to uh, a a criteria that the scientific and medical community can say yes we feel comfortable where for if if people show this level of preservation this level of reliability of this of, of a surgical technique that is being offered to dying patients that are uh, that want to be preserved for future technology if they get to this level, then that is a legitimate thing to offer uh, to human patients. And and with the Brain Preservation Prize, with the Brain Preservation Foundation that I formed uh, uh, and the Brain Preservation Prize, it tries to outline what that criteria should be. The criteria shouldn't be that you prove that somebody can come back. Obviously, that misses the entire point. We're trying to get to future technology. We can't uh, we can't wait for future technology to start applying it to people today. But we can insist that we're not creating massive amounts of damage of the very structures that the that neuroscientists know is, uh, uh, is, is, is crucial to our identity. Mm-hmm. And so we, we've tried to write the prize in such a way that, uh, that uh, it has a, a very rigorous scientific uh, uh, criterion that both groups can agree on, mm-hmm. and and I think I think we've done that because we've got a bunch of skeptics and scientists on our uh, on our uh, board of advisors that are looking at this and saying yes, this is a good prize. Uh, we would take cryonics and other things seriously if they're able to meet this, but we don't think they can meet it. Mm-hmm. And we've got the cryonics and teams like uh, Sean Nicholas and and others saying, oh, I can meet that prize. Mm-hmm. Yes. We can get there. And so if, if they can meet at that level, then the next thing that should happen is the medical community should say, oh, we need to actually start uh, thinking about applying this in hospitals, regulating it like any other type of surgical procedure, and we should do it the right way. So let me ask you this then. Uh, I, I have a few specific details on that whole procedure as it pertains to humans. So first of all, you said that the animal, in this case that you are describing, would be alive, and uh, how painful would that process be for either an animal or a human, especially? Yeah, well, it's not it's not painful at all uh, because uh, the the animal is always put under anesthesia. Um, so, I mean, this is this is a technique that is done thousands of times every day in in, uh, uh, in uh, universities around the world. So, um, and and all of the animals have to go under anesthesia before uh, before this glue around the head procedure. Mm-hmm. And how different is the process that you described to uh, the process being used in, uh, you know, for shows like Body Works, the, the famous plasternation show? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so uh, it is it is actually very different. Uh, the, obviously, there's some f- superficial similarities, 
but the uh, the the chemical and all, all you have to ask is uh, when when scientists are studying the circuitry of brain tissue, what do they use? They use a specific set of chemicals uh, that are that are known to preserve those structures that they're interested in. They don't use the body works body works technique. Because the body works techniques, for instance, the most the, the most simple thing is that body works does not um, uh, it does not use glutaraldehyde. So the so the uh, 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 the uh, the level of protein uh, 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 fixation is not as strong, uh, and they certainly don't use osmium tetroxide. And so all of the membranes go away. In, uh, uh, in, in, in the body works. Uh, uh, you don't notice it at a macroscopic level, but at a microscopic level, you certainly would. Mm-hmm. And scientists would never use that. So basically, you want to go back to what neuroscientists use to study the brain tissue. If that could be applied to a whole human brain, that would probably be a pretty good technique. Mm-hmm. And what do you think would be the relative cost of such a procedure for a, a big object like the human brain yeah relative to what um <laughs> relative to say cryonics because um, i know that you know you have neuro cryonics projects that are about say eighty thousand dollars right now or or so um if i remember from my conversation with max moore who was another guest on this show some time ago and then i think if you have a full body uh cryonic preservation it was about a hundred and fifty thousand dollars or so yeah. So, uh, so what I, what I usually say to that is, um, uh, we, we, we certainly can't give an exact answer, uh, because we don't know that these are techniques, these techniques work. So, so speculating about it, so there is no, there is no protocol that we have today. Uh, we can see hints of what a protocol like this applied to a human being would, would be. But we don't have the protocol yet. It could be that uh, it could be that a chemical brain preservation protocol, in order to get uh, really good uh, access to the to the brain tissue, might require a uh, 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 advanced surgical uh, removal of of, uh, of skull and neuro matter to get into all the crevices, and they have to have this gigantic machine that uh, has thousands of ejection ports to get things in. It could be that it's a hundred million dollar procedure. Now, I don't believe that that's, I don't believe that that's the case. I think that actually it's more likely that it will be much cheaper, uh, in the long run. I think it actually could be on the order of, uh, um, I don't know, $10,000 or something in a, uh, a, as a surgical procedure. But we don't know that because we don't have the procedure yet. So it's very Mm -hmm. difficult to say. The only thing you can say, and, and, and cryonics is the same way. So cryonics, uh, you know, they, the, the procedure that they use that may or may not work and certainly doesn't work to a level that we would be satisfied with as the as as, as perfect right uh, you know they put a price tag on it that uh, that goes with uh, with what their company can afford um, uh, the uh, if if this was adopted throughout the medical community well, there's no reason why cryonics would not also have uh, uh, potentially very low costs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I think the the only the only thing that's really different between uh, cryonics and and uh, chemical brain preservation from a price point of view is the storage. And clearly, it's going to be easier to store uh, a, a room temperature object uh, than something that uh, absolutely cannot vary in temperature more than a few degrees, or yeah. else. Uh, problems uh, occur. Yeah, and and the longer the period, the the bigger the cost difference, obviously. Yeah, I mean, you know, one, well, one thing I I often say though is um, uh, uh, because it would be it would be great to have a low cost procedure, and I think it would be absolutely great for people to adopt this and and to do away with some of the fear of death on a massive scale. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and 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 I would and I say it would also be fantastic if people started to. Uh, uh, to accept this, uh, and, and incorporate it into their quality of life in a way that says, uh, you know, 
I would rather go in for a live chemical brain preservation procedure when I'm 60, let's say, mm -hmm. than to wait until I'm 80 and on death's door and have gone through uh, Alzheimer's. a million dollars worth of uh, uh, taxpayer uh, 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 painful surgeries. And then at the very moment when I'm, uh, when I'm almost totally destroyed anyway, go in for this procedure. I think that uh, I, I think that uh, having this as a viable option for people would be fantastic in, on many different scales. Um, well, but you know, it, uh, just one one more uh, uh, one more thing. But uh, talking about the price issue, uh, it it is a little bit bizarre because if you have a ten thousand dollar procedure for chemically preserving somebody, we know that bringing somebody back on today's technology would take hundreds of billions of dollars. <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's, it, it really is somewhat silly talking about it from a price point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you go to a great extent in your paper here, Killed by Bad Philosophy, uh, talking about the procedure too. And, uh, you know, Part of the, the thing that people have to overcome is like their intuitive revulsion, perhaps, of that process. Because it, it, it looks scary. I mean, people don't like going to the dentist. Now imagine being infused with all kinds of highly toxic chemicals and, and all that that you describe in great detail. So, what do you think would be the difference in terms of public perception and potentially acceptance of, of your proposal if there were a non-invasive way of preserving the brain rather than the highly invasive method that you're proposing? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I can't... I, I'm not because sure imagine if you have, like, <laughs> some kind of a... And, you know, I'm a non-expert, so I'm totally speculating. But if you can accomplish that kind of resolution without having to slice the, the brain into pieces uh, with a very high, you know, fMRI machine or, or something yeah, like yeah, that. You're saying. So you're saying the uh, not, not the preservation technique, per se. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think it comes because down to... Because the idea is that you, you're trying to preserve the, the, the physical object only so that you get out that information that is stored there. So, if we can extract the information, you know, as it is, non-invasively, we don't really care, I think, about the, the object itself, do we? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I, I, I think it would be, it, it would be, um, uh, from a public perception point of view, I, I agree completely that uh, uh, nobody wants to think about uh, um, uh, having the most deadly chemicals put into their bodies, uh, even though it wouldn't feel like anything. Like I said, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, we know how to put people under anesthesia. But, um, uh, the idea of slicing a brain and, uh, uh, that is plastic embedded and, uh, reading it off and putting it into a computer, gee, it would be much nicer to have a little red pill that you can take and, uh, and it makes you healthy and, uh, live forever. Um, the, the, the problem is that we, these, these technologies are very difficult. Uh, even this, this is kind of the, the zeroth order. Chemical brain preservation is, is essentially the, the easiest as it can get <laughs> from a technological standpoint to preserve what neuroscience says. I think cryonics is harder. Uh, chemical brain preservation is is easier uh, simply because uh, it is it's using a big hammer <laughs> uh, uh, called chemical fixations um, and so to uh, to 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 ask would it be nicer from a public perception not to have to do this is it's kind of like asking uh, it would be it would be much nicer to have teleporter you know, transporters than airplanes. Because airplanes crash, you have to, uh, you know, sit next to other people for hours and hours of time. It's, it's just a pain. Can't we just forget about airplanes? Let's not develop them. 
and go directly to transporters? No. <laughs> because transporter technology is, you know, probably hundreds of years in advance of, of airplane technology. And it's the same thing I would have to say for any of these other techniques. If we want to get to the future today, we want to have a chance for people today to be put it in some type of suspended animation to get to the future of tomorrow, uh, then we've only got two techniques that really come uh, to mind. One is cryonics, one is chemical brain preservation. And I'm happy that both of them are competing for the prize. <laughs> so tell me in brief, because we're kind of running out of time here, but in brief, what's your take on the pros and the cons of cryonics as it is today? Because cryonics obviously has a much longer history than, than your proposal, uh, and, and in the sense that, well, based on what you said, that's probably a false statement that I just made. Uh, let me reconsider that point. Okay. <laughs> well, they have their own histories. Certainly, it's been applied to human beings longer than, <laughs> than the other. Yeah, and, and I remember one particular experiment that I, I watched a documentary on which very impressed me, and that was about, uh, the vitrification of a, of a, I think it was a rabbit kidney mm -hmm. that was vitrified for a couple of days and then it was surgically transplanted back into the rabbit or a different rabbit and that kidney was functioning actually and the rabbit survived for a few days at least. Right. So therefore, months. sorry? Uh, it was actually a few months. Uh, there's a, there's a paper on that. Yeah. So, so therefore that was taken as a strong evidence in support of the fact that, you know, we are making progress towards better vitrif vitrification and therefore diminishing the damages of ice accumulation and the, the sort of the, the freezing process and so on. And, and therefore we have better chances of accomplishing, you know, zero or the minimum amount of hopefully reversible damage that we can incur during the, the process itself. Right. Um, so, uh, so when, when, I, when I try to compare these two, um, it, it really comes down to, uh, it, it comes down to electron microscopy evidence. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the cryonics community should have Let's, let's be specific. Alcor. Alcor, the company that is offering this to human beings as a service. I am a member of Alcor. Okay. Uh, I am a, you know, uh, pay dues. <laughs> so, uh, as a customer, uh, I would expect to have reams and reams of electron microscopy evidence of what my brain is going to look like if I undergo their procedures, especially if it costs hundred thousand dollars and up. They don't have that. They have great reasons for not having that. I think they're great people. I think that they are trying as hard as they can and the world is against them. Okay. Uh I, I completely understand that. But at the same time that is the only thing that uh short of a dog getting up and walking off the table uh, after undergoing this procedure, that's the only thing that the scientific community is going to be turned by. Uh, if they, if they start showing, uh, comprehensive surveys with electron microscopy of cryopreserved brains and saying, here is the level of damage, we will enter a new realm for science of crimes. Uh, Alcor itself has not been uh, uh, has has not seen that it is the proper time. Has refused. I don't know how to, how to put it uh, to get into the prize contest itself. But 21st Century Medicine, uh, which is a, uh, a cryobiology research company that uh, works with some of the same techniques that the kidney uh, vitrification research that you just described, uh, has been uh, very uh, good. Uh, in, uh, in, in trying to work with us and trying to work with a, um, with our requirements for electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. And they have been, uh, they've been running tissue samples. They have been, uh, 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 trying to get their techniques so that we can look at them in an electron, so they can look at them in an electron microscope and, and actually show the level of damage. 
It's an ongoing process. Uh, it is uh, uh, the, the electron micrographs that are out there that I've seen of chronically preserved tissue do not look normal, but that is not necessarily saying that there was damage. It just means that it looks uh, it, it looks unlike what the textbooks say chemical preservation looks like, which we know also has artifacts. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we are we are at this stage in crimes where there are more questions than uh, uh, than there should be, and the people with money. Uh, that support crimes, the people with, with money that would potentially uh, go in for crimes, uh, they should really think about putting their money into uh, scientific investigation of how good chronics is. You know, fund a team, fund uh, some independent study uh, of, of, of what the quality level is, and tell the rest of the world. Uh, and, and so the more light that we can shine on this, uh, uh, the better from everyone's perspective. Perhaps they can fund a, a cryonics prize similar to yours about, you know, the cryopreservation of a mouse brain or something with the least amount of damage and you put up the factors there that you would accept as, you know, evidence in support of that claim and yeah. let it be. Uh, absolutely. I mean, people have, uh, uh, that idea has been floating around for a while. And given the fact that we have people that, um, uh, that put uh, hundreds of millions of, uh, of dollars into building uh, private spacecraft. Uh, you would think that somebody would say, "Hey, you know, let's let's figure out what the current state of, tech, uh, of technology is for chronics and mm -hmm. and other alternatives, and uh, and uh, let let's see if we've advanced from the 1960s because we certainly have advanced from the 1960s. Anybody who has, has their their mind stuck in chronics can't work because of this argument that was formulated in the 1960s needs to wake up. It's 50 years later. We've, we've done quite uh, a number of advances over that technology uh, from a biology point of view, and yeah. it's time to reevaluate the entire, uh, the entire premise, the entire field. Ken, time is really advancing and working against us in Seriously here, so um, I kind of want to go through the last three questions here before we call it today. Um, so, I, uh, you, you told us that you're a member who pays fee of, of Alcor, for Alcor, but uh, does that mean that, I, I take it that means that you do plan to preserve your own brain? Um, I, I, I plan to preserve my own brain if there is a technique that is, uh, uh, that is, uh, proven to have a certain level of quality. Mm -hmm. uh, if if it turns out in the next few years that uh, that Alcor and others uh, cannot live up to the expectations of the Brain Preservation Prize, then I will reluctantly withdraw my support and will re reluctantly um, uh, uh, go back to a normal individual that uh, uh, plans which casket they want. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to think that uh, that Alcor and, uh, and or one of these other organizations will be able to meet the requirements of the Brain Preservation Prize uh, within a few years, and so I give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and until that, uh, I also would like to think that there will be other options that will occur, like chemical brain preservation. Uh, I would, if both of them were available and both of them were um, uh, equally rigorously scientifically tested to preserve the, the brain structure, I would go for the chemical brain preservation. Uh, that's my, that's my bias. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yes, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, there is a reasonable possibility that none of this will occur, uh, that Nobody will come up with evidence that chronics works. Nobody will come up with evidence that chemical brain, brain preservation works. And that it will never get to a level where it's that rigorous within my lifetime, which you know, I might die tomorrow for all I know. In which case, I will be dead. And that's okay. Uh, that's okay. People have died uh, uh, forever. So I'll be just one of those ones that missed it by that much. Uh, and, and that will suck. And I hope that everybody realizes that if they miss it by that much, that it sucks. 
and that they should try just a little bit harder. And so maybe my kids will be able to, uh, to walk on that, uh, that planet around another star, uh, even though I can. Yeah, I don't know about the, the normal people, but if I, if I'm not convinced that this will work, I would not even want to have a casket at all. Yeah. Personally. Okay. Uh, but anyway, let's go to the last two questions that I traditionally ask of guests on my show. And uh, the second last is this. Where can people find more about you and your work? Yeah, well, the best place is uh, uh, brainpreservation.org. That's, uh, that's the best place. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. And finally, Ken, do you have a, a message? The single most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this interview today? Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the, the most important thing that, um, uh, that I would want pe- people to take away from it is, uh, you know, we are very close from a scientific perspective to having a technique that can put somebody in suspended animation uh, so that they can uh, get to future technology. Uh, We need to be open-minded in what that technology can be. Uh, It it is, uh, you you, you can't start evaluating it by saying, I'm not going to believe the neuroscience textbooks when they say that we are, uh, you know, the products of the computations of the human mind. You know, if you start taking science, whole realms of science off the uh, uh, off the table in your intellectual discussion, that's a problem. And I think a lot of people do that, uh, and they say, well, chemical brain preservation will never work because it requires mind uploading, it requires this other stuff. Well, you need to go back to the science. So I would say if people uh, accept science, accept what the science has to say currently, uh, as being our best guess, may not be perfect, but our best guess about way, wh- who we are and the way the universe works, then uh, if we tried within five years, we could have uh, a reliable, rigorously scientifically proven preservation procedure for human beings that was offered in hospitals in a regulated environment where somebody could go in and they wouldn't have a uh, this feel of, oh, this is the biggest long shot I'll ever take. It's 0.1% chance that it'll work. They'll have a, a, a feel that this is a 99% chance that I'm going to wake up from this. And we could get there in, in five years if we just accept the science and accept what it's telling us about, uh, about us and our options. And so I think that that's, you know, I, I would, I would, I would ask people to look into it and see where the holes are, uh, but look into it with an open mind and accept what science is saying. Ken Hayworth, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much.